Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you, magnify you, glorify you, and give you praise. Indeed, you are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. God, we acknowledge that today, articulating to you what you've already done for us in our individual and collective lives. God, you have made a way over and over again. You make a way. We don't know why, but you did it, and we're grateful that you did. Father, it is now preaching, teaching time. God, as we stand to preach and to proclaim, may you be glorified. Would you minimize curry, maximize Christ? Would you have your way in this place today? Hide me behind the cross. Let the people not see me, but let them see thee. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me and have your way. This is our prayer today. Move anxiety and nervousness and all of that and get the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make his boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Amen. 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 We are glad to be in the service one more time. I said we're glad to be in the service one more time. Amen. Amen. To God our Father, Christ our Savior, the Holy Spirit our Helper, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I bring you greetings from the Friendship Baptist Church, your Belinda, California, that's in North Orange County about round the corner from Nixon's library, just a little church trying to do great ministry for a great God. And I'm grateful my people are online this morning. Amen. My chair of the deacon board called me at 5 a.m., 2 a.m. his time to pray for the pastor. And I just thank God for friendship, being with us here at Providence. Come on, give God praise. Amen. Amen. Friendship is a church where Christ is magnified. We like high worship, exciting preaching, and we're grateful to be here with you on today. First, giving praises, honor, and glory to God who is the head of my life. He's the rock, my rock, and my fortress, and in him I do trust. We honor the life and ministry of this great pastor, of this great church, and the person of the Reverend Dr. Damon P. Come on, Damon P. Williams. Let's thank God for the set man of this house. Thank God for his leadership. Thank God for his faithfulness, his stewardship, his scholarship. We are grateful to God for him today and we're honored to be here with you on today. We are grateful also for his wife, the Reverend Dr. Khalil Williams. Come on, give God praise. Amen, amen, amen. We praise the Lord for her. We thank both of you for your leadership and your kindness. You do not have to be and you have been. To the official officers of this church, the clergy, the deacons, trustees, staff, those visiting with us uh, for this great occasion, he, Pastor Williams, Dr. Williams could have chosen anyone, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Uh, to all those leaders in the church, I, I'm a church boy, so I honor leaders in the church for your faithfulness and for your kindness. Amen? To the Reverend Elijah Hunt and uh, Reverend uh, Orinthio Gerard Flowers. They keep saying OJ. Amen. Orinthio Gerard Flowers uh, and their families, uh, we honor you on today and we celebrate what God is doing in your lives as you formally today launch into ministry. We're grateful to be here. Uh, as Pastor uh, Williams has said, uh, OJ is my uh, homeboy, we uh, go way back 22 years. We served on staff together at Friendship Baptist Church way before I was the pastor. Amen. Uh, he was the business manager. I was the minister of uh, uh, youth, then children and youth. And uh, we uh, forged a friendship. And then uh, he decided to move to Atlanta. Amen. 
And when he first moved, I was going through uh, uh, friendship withdrawals. I was here every year, and it looks like I haven't been back since they got married. Amen. So I'm grateful to be here today to share with you all uh, in uh, the Word of God, but also in this great occasion. I'm a person that wants to get to the Word of God. Amen. And do my very best to articulate what thus saith the Lord. Would you join me in Luke chapter 4? Luke chapter 4, I'm going to read the entirety of the text, but focus on uh, verses uh, 18 and 19. But I want to read just so that we have context today. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 20. Uh, I read from the English Standard Version, and I'll read that for you. Uh, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. His teaching, he was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read. Verse 17, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. One more time, verses 18 and 19, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Thus ends the reading of God's word. In their book, Mission Drift, The Unspoken Crisis of Facing Leaders, Charities, and Churches, Chris Horse, Anna Haggard, and Peter Greer address the mission drift phenomena. What is the mission drift phenomena? I'm so glad you asked me that. Mission drift can be defined as a move away from the goals established in an organization's purpose statement. Mission drift is a situation where formerly focused, single-minded organizations become distracted, inefficient, and unable to meet their stated goals. Mission drift is a widespread phenomena that can occur in any organization, anywhere, can happen with people. Uh, mission drift uh, uh, will push you off course of where God had intended and purpose for you to be. Too often, a, uh, Christian organizations, as they grow, the gospel becomes uh, uh, cursory. It becomes expendable or even forgotten. It is not at the center of ministry again and again. Leaders have watched churches, ministries, businesses, and nonprofits uh, professionalize, expand, and then lose sight of their original goals. Examples of mission drift would be a church that allows its food pantry or social justice ministry to become its primary focus, forgetting the importance and priority of teaching, preaching, and sharing the gospel. And beloved, if mission drift is left unchecked, it often leads to complete mission abandonment. That is, the mission no longer drives the ministry or the organization or its leaders. The organization stops putting its efforts in the right places, leaving its founding principles and its stated mission. Now, beloved, mission drift seems to be the natural tendency in organizations, including churches. And as time goes on, we all face the challenge of remaining true to our mission, true to what God's called us to do, true to being who God's called us to be, true to being faithful to God's word, his purposes and plan for our lives. The temptation to veer off our original purpose resulting in mission drift is real. Mission drift can be either intentional or unintentional. In most cases, mission drift is unintentional and has a negative impact because it harms the integrity of an organization and the integrity of people. The authors of this book say the natural course, the unfortunate natural evolution of many uh, originally Christ-centered ministries is to drift off course. Uh, mission drift does not happen overnight. It takes place when relatively minor decisions compounded by time lead to entirely different identities. Churches much avoid mission drift. 
preachers must avoid mission drift. In other words, ministry-minded individuals must keep the main thing, the main thing. And as we celebrate today, as we commemorate today, as we consider the ordination of these two men of God, as we consecrate and set them apart to the work of God, I want to remind Reverend Elijah Hunt, and I want to remind Reverend Orinthio Flowers, and those of us who are here today, we are the church. I want to remind us to remain mission-minded. That's my subject today, remain mission-minded. Remain mission-minded. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Hunt flowers, whatever you do, wherever you go. However God uses you in every place and in every space that God gives you, remain mission-minded. Remember what you've been called to. And then remember who called you to do it. I said, remember what you've been called to. And then remember who called you to do it. Not only do I invite and challenge and charge Reverend Flowers and Reverend Hunt to remain mission-minded, I invite all of us who are God's children as members of the church, Christ church, whether friendship or providence, I invite us to remain mission-minded. Today is a good day to remember the purposes of the church uh, as we move towards our text. And as we have this conversation on mission, I invite our attention to Luke chapter 4. The Gospel of Luke is written by a physician who followed Paul in his ministry. He is a physician who becomes uh, clearly uh, uh, meticulous in his chronicling, not only of Paul's ministry, but ultimately Jesus' ministry. In Luke's gospel, he seeks to show us Jesus, but also to show us Jesus' humanity in touching people. If the Gospel of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, rather, there is an undeniable personal aspect of the Gospel. Luke is clearly interested in people. Much of the ministry or the material uh, unique to Luke's Gospel involves Jesus' interaction with individuals, many of them on the fringes of acceptable society. They're sinners, they're women, they're children, they're, on, they're marginalized, often forgotten. Like Matthew and Mark, Luke records the incident of the woman coming to pour perfume on Jesus' feet. But it's Luke who in his gospel lets us know that she was an immoral woman. In a similar way, we find Luke alone with conversations about robbers uh, crucified with Jesus, uh, helping us to understand the importance of ministering to those who are lost, least, and left out. Beloved, I like Luke's gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, as, as we move in more specifically to chapter 4, uh, Luke shows us that Jesus is launching his ministry. The launch takes place after Jesus faced down Satan in the wilderness. Uh, yes, beloved, Jesus came face to face with the, the devil and was ultimately victorious. And with that victory, Jesus was now ready to step into his public ministry, to stand tall and deliver his first sermon right in his hometown. In the greater narrative of Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 20, Luke tells us that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit to Galilee. The encounter with the devil didn't uh, uh, weaken him, no, it strengthened him. Beloved, we have to understand that our trials, our troubles, and our tangles actually will strengthen us. When we look back over our lives and see the difficulties that we have come through, then we are able to see I'm stronger now. I'm better now. I'm wiser now. I know it hurt me, but it also pushed me. I know it shocked me, but it also strengthened me. His life journey... Uh, did not harm him, but it gave him substance for his ministry. Hunt and flowers, remember everything you've been through, your life experience gives you substance for your ministry. He went down from Galilee to Nazareth, uh, uh, and as the gospel tells us, because he had a mission to reach people. Don't forget, uh, there were synagogues he could have gone to in Galilee and started his ministry. Uh, but Jesus uh, went back home, and he had an opportunity uh, as people were praising him and talking about how good he was doing. Uh, he goes back home, and Luke is meticulous to point out that he went back home to Nazareth, where he was brought up. Jesus was no stranger to the synagogue. He was there regularly, not just showing up for religious events like some do now. No, Jesus was faithful. He went to worship. He showed up at church. He didn't have a problem being there. And when Jesus stands up to read Dr. Williams, someone handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. But the Bible says that Jesus, uh, being who he is, chose the passage for himself. They gave him the scroll, but Jesus was intentional in what he read that day. Jesus stood up to read 
And as the passage noted here in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, he combines and condenses the servant song, which is from Isaiah chapter 58 and 6, and Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus himself combined these readings to carefully craft his own personal ministry mission statement. Whatever the case was, Jesus begins his public ministry and he articulates to those around him and even for us today what his ministry and mission focus was. Here, Jesus summarizes his mission and his ministry focus. And today, beloved, I want us to consider three particular aspects of ministry articulated in the mission statement provided as we seek to remain ministry-minded or mission-minded. First, beloved, the ministry is about proclamation. The ministry is about proclamation. In what Jesus declares, he prioritizes the proclamation of the gospel. Listen to the passage again, verse 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came with proclamation. Jesus came preaching and teaching. Jesus came to proclaim the kingdom of God. Now listen here, beloved. The term proclamation is emphasized not once, not twice, but three times. Indeed, proclamation was at the very heart of Christ's ministry. When Jesus preached, it was about proclaiming the kingdom of God and his rightful place in the grand story of redemption. And let me tell you something. The foundation of that mighty proclamation, uh, Jesus urgently called men and women to repentance. He urgently called us to look to him. He urgently called us to not allow our past, not allow our problems, not allow our predicaments to overshadow what Christ wants to do in our individual and collective lives. Uh, beloved, uh, not only does he do that, he doesn't stop there. He speaks powerfully about the discipline and high ethical standards of kingdom citizenship. He sought to grow and mature the people of God in the kingdom, help us to understand that we have a new strong community grounded in spiritual truth. And let us not forget Jesus proclaimed loud and clear the centrality of his redemptive deed in salvation history. Proclamation was not only a, a part of his ministry, it was the heart of his ministry. And Hunt and Flowers, I want to remind you that proclamation is at the heart of the ministry God's called you to do. Uh, I, I want to remind you that you are called to be the herald of God. You are called to be the spokesperson of God. You are called to be the prophet of God, to speak truth to power, to remind the saints of their great hope in a God who is faithful to them, to remind them that Christ died a criminal's death on Calvary's cross, to remind them there's their hope for a brighter tomorrow. And beloved, I stopped by to tell you that we cannot put that just on the preachers. But if you've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light, guess what? You have been called to proclaim uh, that he's made a way for me, uh, that he's brought me out. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I love church. And, and, and Dr. Williams and Dr. Williams, well, we don't testify anymore. But your testimony is a proclamation of how great God is. Uh, I'm so glad that I have a testimony that he brought me out and made a way. I, I got on robes and stoles today, but God had to do a transformative work in my life. And uh, as preachers, as, as Christians, we proclaim him. We should not seek to exalt ourselves. It ain't about who we are. It ain't about where we've come from necessarily, but it's all about what God's done. And I love school. Get every degree you can. Get every opportunity you can get into. But I stop by to tell you, don't let your degree overshadow the Word of God and the purposes of God in your life. Don't let what you got on the wall out, out, outweigh what you say out of your lips about who God is. Proclamation of the gospel exalts Christ and helps people to have a high view of who He is, reminding them uh, and this is just something I do every Sunday at Friendship. Reminds us that he's a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Proclamation is not merely what we say, however, but it is also what we do or how we live. And people would rather see a sermon lived out than hear one any day. Edgar A. Guest wrote, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. 
I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell me the way. The eye is better, is a better pupil, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. And the best of all the preachers are men who live their creeds. For to see a good part in action is what everybody needs. Uh, beloved, we need to remember proclamation is not just what we say, but it is who we are. And as I move from this point, proclamation of the gospel is personal, it is propositional, and it's progressional. It's personal because it's the good news of the person, Jesus Christ. He came to offer himself personally. Uh, it, 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 the, the good news of Jesus is propositional because he came with a message. The message is life-changing and powerful. There is hope for the hopeless. There's help for the helpless. There's life for those that feel like they're lifeless. But it's also a progressional message because this is a message that keeps going. I like what Jesus said in Luke chapter, excuse me, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. And the word of God is still going. It's here in America. It's in Atlanta and your Belinda. It's in the, in the ghettos and it's in the suburbs. It's everywhere. The gospel is progressional. The ministry or the mission is about proclamation. Secondly, the mission is about transformation. Uh, Jesus saw his mission was to fulfill God's plan of justice, compassion, and love in the world. This was not just about having a specific uh, profession, but a way of life. Uh, it didn't matter that it, he was in with private people or a public event, if he was alone with the disciples or even with enemies. Jesus sought to bring transformation in every situation. Transformation is about change, and the text says to proclaim good news to the poor. The text says he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. The text says he sent me to bring recovery of sight to the blind. The text says to set the oppressed free. Jesus was not proclaiming just to be heard, but he was proclaiming for transformation. He was sent to proclaim so that men, women, boys, and girls would be changed. Uh, he was sent to uh, bring hope to the hopeless situations. He was sent to bring light in dark situations. He was sent to bring help to seemingly helpless situations. Hunt and flowers, you are not sent to proclaim so people can say how great you are and shout and holler. You are sent to be agents of transformation. I almost feel like preaching. God wants you and your ministry and your life to be used as tools of transformation for the marginalized, the forgotten, the broken, the discouraged, the disheartened, the battered, the bruised. God wants to use you. What mattered to Jesus was taking every opportunity that came in his way to change the world. He was clearly mission focused. Remember the transformative acts of Jesus. Jesus healed the sick, including lepers, the blind, and the paralyzed. Jesus fed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread demonstrating his divine provision. Jesus cast out demons, freeing many from spiritual bondage. Jesus showed compassion to the poor, the widows, and children. Jesus taught and preached and providing profound teaching of love, humility, and righteousness. Jesus forgave sin and gave healing and spiritual redemption. Jesus calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee, reminding us that he can calm the storms in our life. Jesus taught in parables to remind us us, that we can have truth in our life. Jesus trained up disciples, reminding us that there's a foundation for the church. Jesus went to the cross. Uh, somebody said Jesus went uh, to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. They hung him high and stretched him wide. Uh, he hung his head for you and me. He died. Uh, remember, Jesus was transformative in his mission. Beloved, this is not only the mission of these two uh, men who are to be ordained officially today. No, this is the mission of the church. The church, you and me are conduits of transformation. Uh, we're conduits of transformation, of change. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the mission is about proclamation. The mission is about transformation. Third and finally, I'll get out the way because I don't want us to be here too long, Dr. Williams. Uh, uh, but finally, uh, the, the mission is about the population. It's about the population. Now, stay with me. Uh, my, my, my alliteration is important to me, and so I need to explain sometimes what I'm trying to say. The mission is about population. That, that is, the mission is about people. 
The mission is not about theological debates. It's about people. The mission is not about denominational conflict. It's about people. The mission is not about theoretical ideologies. It's about people. The text implies explicitly that Jesus came for people. Let me bring it a little closer. The church is about people. Ministry is about people. If it is people who are in bondage, it is people who need sight, it is people who need hope, it is people who need transformation, it is people who need help, it is people who need joy, it is people that need to be lifted, it is people. And beloved, you must keep people in your windshield. You must see them, not in the rearview mirror. You got to see them as the focus, Lord have mercy. And I just want to remind us uh, that uh, it's about people, but I need to give you the other side of it. People are flawed folk. People get on your nerves. People will make you sick, but we must still minister to people. We must engage people. We must pray for people. It's people, not ideas or agendas or political parties. It's people and not just certain people, not just the people you like, not just the people that are nice to you. It's got to be about all people. I got to get out of here. All people, the uh, rich people, poor people, broken people, marginalized people, bereaved people, mean people, intellectual people, confused people, needy people. Lori, I like what uh, Jonathan McReynolds says about people. Jonathan McReynolds says they are the best and the worst God created. Loving and hated and opinionated. Loners and basements and those congregated. People. He calls them people. If you, get, if you look at the lyrics, he says crazy people. Trolling people. Self-righteous people. Entitled people. Hating people. Lying people. Disrespectful people. But here's my favorite part. He pauses and says, forgive me when I'm one of those people. Because if we're honest, that every now and then we crazy people every now and then we are confusing people every now and then preachers we are messed up people but the mission uh, is still about people uh, it's about imperfect people and the gospel is about people uh, imperfect people for it was for people uh, that Jesus went to the cross uh, it was for people uh, that Jesus allowed himself to be crucified uh, he was wounded uh, for our transgressions uh, bruised uh, for our iniquities uh, it was for people uh, that he became the scapegoat uh, it was for people uh, that he died a criminal's death on Calvary's cross. Uh, it was for people, uh, people that he was placed in a borrowed tomb, uh, for people uh, that he resurrected on the third day. Uh, it was for people uh, that he allowed preachers uh, to be called, uh, set apart, uh, to be used for his glory. It was for people that we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was for people that we talk about transformation. It was for people uh, that we talk about uh, how how great our God is uh, is not uh, for us to be uh, 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 put up and seen by folk uh, but it's for us to remind folk uh, that we serve a Savior uh, that is able to change your life uh, we serve a Savior uh, that will pick you up uh, turn you around uh, place your feet uh, on solid ground uh, I've got to go, uh, but is there anybody here uh, that will testify uh, that God has uh, been good to you? Uh, is there anybody here uh, that can testify uh, that he's made a way out of no way? Uh, turn your midnight into day. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that will testify uh, he is uh, my way maker, uh, miracle worker, uh, promise keeper? Uh, light in the darkness yes well you have a responsibility to lift him up lift him up how to reach the masses men of every birth for an answer jesus gave the key and if i if i be lifted up i'll draw all people unto me lift him up lift him up Proclaim Jesus, uh, lift him up uh, till he speaks from eternity. And if I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all people unto me.